And thank you for that lovely introduction, very generous introduction. And I didn't realize that um, uh, in 2003 that we'd met first at your at a, at a class at the LBC. And what a <clears throat> what an incredible thing in a way the Sangha is and the Dharma is that we can keep meeting in um, in different ways. And uh, well, you've had a transformative experience yourself, haven't you, Vidya Saki? And I'm delighted that you're going to be the next chair of the centre. Uh, I'm really, really pleased for uh, the whole of the Sangha. I think um, it's, a, it's a real boon that you've decided and the council have decided that uh, uh, you, you will be the next chair. That's very good. So a pleasure to be um, here amongst you. Welcome to my bedroom. And uh, uh, I hope that um, we can have a fruitful conversation, discussion over the next four days. I'm going to be doing most of the talking, but I hope that you'll also join in. We'll have, um, we'll have uh, uh, small groups, um, you know, at some point during the morning uh, where you can meet and talk about some of what I'm talking about in, in smaller numbers. And then we'll also have some time for question and answers. So, and we'll also have a tea break. So it's not gonna be a, a big slog of uh, two and a quarter hours or whatever it is. And I'll um, be aiming to finish around half 12. So you've got a bit of time to get some lunch together and, uh, and, and, and so forth. And um, so what I'm gonna be talking about uh, is um, consciousness. Well, that was the title that I was given. Uh, so it's a, bit, it's a bit of a daunting thing. Uh, to talk about consciousness, which is uh, said to be inconceivable and uh, something that you can't talk about. So it's a bit of a daunting thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm fortunate in that uh, Sabuti, who's the president of the London Buddhist Centre, where I am, um, has talked quite a lot about consciousness. And I'm going to be basing much of what I say, at least uh, I hope to be basing much of what I say, on material that he's given um, in uh, 2013, 2014. Um, he came to the LBC every uh, six months or so and um, gave these series of talks that he called rambles, rambles around reality. Um, he, he called them rambles because he, he said that he didn't really know where he was gonna go uh, when he was talking off the cuff as it were. Um, as it is, Sabuti, even when he rambles, is extremely clear, extremely articulate, and extremely directed. Uh, so if you want uh, more clarity and more direction than I can give, then I do want to point you to um, those talks on Free Buddhist Audio, Rambles Around Reality. There's several sets, and um, there's at least two sets on the nature of consciousness. One is called one set is called Consciousness Unfolds, <laughs> and the other one, uh, rather uninspiringly, is called More on Consciousness. Uh, uh, at least that was the title that he gave it when he gave it at the LBC. It might be that on Free Buddhist Audio, it's got a more inspiring title, I'm not completely sure. Um, but anyway, I'm just trying to point you to, there is, um, as it were, more material, um, if you want. And I, to be honest, I'm... I'm not sure how clearly I'm going to be able to articulate. I can't do what Sabuti does, but I'm going to give it a go in my own way. And we've got four days to explore it. And I hope that you'll sort of help me explore it by thinking about your own experience in relation to what I'm saying, but also by asking questions and um, seeing where you want to go with this material. Okay, so that's a little bit of a preamble. So for me, um, this question of uh, what is it to be aware? What is the nature of life? What is it to be alive and conscious at all? Um, that was a question that was um, there from childhood. Um, well before, long before I thought of myself as a Buddhist, long before I'd come across uh, Buddhism, um, I had as a lot of kids do probably, uh, um, this wonder at being alive and in the world. Um, 
I think uh, children naturally have this capacity for wonder, don't they? And um, uh, often we sort of lose it as we grow older. Um, uh, I've got a great nephew now. Um, my nephew has, and his wife have just had a son six months old yesterday, I think, or two days ago, he became six months old. And um, he, when I've seen him is, um, you know, everything is uh, uh, sort of miraculous. I mean, he, he can just gaze at a pot plant and uh, be enthralled uh, and, uh, uh, and start trying to interact with it, talk to it in his own way. And, um, uh, you know, just be, everything is wonderful. And I can remember, you know, my own nephew, I don't have kids, but my, my nephew, when he was about two or, or maybe even younger, um, you know, I took him out for a walk and he could walk and, you know, he'd hold my hand well, he'd hold my finger really with his hand and we'd go for a walk. And I can remember sort of him, uh, you know, I used to live in North London and he'd just suddenly pause and bend down on the ground and be entranced with a, a leaf. And, uh, and, and we'd have to wait and, and, you know, he'd look at the leaf and examine it. There'd be this glorious sen sense of uh, wonder and, um, Unfortunately, we lose that, don't we? We lose that as um, as we grow older. Uh, I think that um, in adolescence, adolescents often have, I don't know about a sense of wonder because they are often rather bored, aren't they? It, 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 by the world uh, and what life has to offer. But what they do sometimes have in a rather inconvenient and sometimes angry way is a sense of questioning what life is about. Uh, what are we doing? And to them, uh, our adult world, maybe it, it's like this with you still or me sometimes. So to them, our adult world seems bonkers. Uh, why are adults just behaving in a, a really stupid way uh, and uh, messing up the world in the process and you get this adolescent kind of reaction don't you well I I think that there's something positive in that adolescent reaction mixed in with a lot of confusion negativity uh, and, and, and so forth <clears throat> because there is a freshness to the questioning and um, often um, we, we, we lose that freshness as we just become settled in our lives. Sometimes we regain it painfully uh, in moments of crisis. Um, maybe there's a midlife crisis or maybe there's a bereavement or a divorce or a redundancy or, or some other crisis in our life. And we are forced to look at the world and look at our lives afresh and normally um, uh, it's a painful process. Um, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm saying all that because for me, I think I'm, I've been really fortunate in that I found the Dharma in my 20s. I did go through a process of sort of disillusionment and reactive sort of angry, why at the state of the world, why is it as it is? And I grew up in the Thatcher era and went you know, protesting and 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 uh, um, picketing for the miners and so forth. You know, trying to change the world through uh, politics. I, I went through a sort of student phase of that in my early twenties, late teens and early twenties. But I, um, I think I never lost this sense that there was more to life, more to the world and crucially more to consciousness awareness than meets the eye now part of that was um i think it was just uh, a precocious kind of um sense of wonder i, I came across um uh, a school project that i must have done at the age of nine or ten where i 
you, you could do a project on anything you wanted to do. And I did this project called Looking at Life, where I question what life is and, and go through the various phases of life from childhood to uh, adolescence to, um, uh, a, you know, well, in my case, it was a young man and then a middle-aged man and an old man and then a dying person and then question whether death is the end. And, and I, I was sort of um, curious as to why we lived the way we did. Uh, and then when I was 11 and my dad died rather suddenly, that curiosity, I mean, um, you know, as, as well as all the consequences of bereavement, which I'm not going to go into, <laughs> that curiosity was awakened even more. And um, uh, I began to um, try and communicate with my father, my dead dad, uh, through a pack of playing cards and through sort of um, um, trying to um, create a, a sort of magical ritual of my own. And uh, it seemed to work in that the communication seemed to be two way. I'd ask questions of these cards and I'd get responses that were consistent. And uh, I was about 11 or 12. And uh, what it convinced me in, and, and other sort of weird psychic phenomena happened. Uh, and I don't think I'm special about this. Um, uh, I was recently watching Netflix's um, Surviving Death documentary, which I was talking about um, uh, uh, on Wednesday night to uh, um, in a Mitra evening here. Uh, and Anyway, in this documentary, if, you, if you're interested in sort of consciousness beyond death, I'd really recommend it. In this documentary, you've got interviews with people with either with, well, some with near-death experiences, some with experiences of communicating with the dead, some with um, experiences that were very similar to mine. Um, for example, um, uh, objects would move in the house uh, and, um, you know, various psychic kind of phenomena happen. Anyway, all of this um, um, convinced me that there was more than uh, our normal assumptions, you know, uh, about life. My dad's death had already started convinced, sort of question me questioning on, well, you know, I didn't want to live the life that he seemed to have lived. Uh, uh, to my young eyes, it seemed a bit of a waste. Uh, he died at 45 and um, of a heart attack. And as far as I could see, he'd spent his life trying to earn as much money as we could. We didn't have very much money. Then we eventually had enough money to buy a car. We didn't have money for holidays. Him and my mum didn't really get on. They were constantly kind of rowing. And um, I don't know, there was just, and then it ended <laughs> just like that. And I thought, well, what is it that adults do? I don't want to just get a job and get a mortgage. And, you know, yes, I like cars, but, you know, that can't be the point. That can't be the point if, if you just die. And... Um, I think I was fortunate in that I didn't really let go of that questing and then in a way did eventually come come across Buddhism initially through some books on Zen Buddhism who of course Zen Buddhism was um, the only sort of Buddhism I'd, I kind of knew about and these books these popular books that I read were full of um, enigmatic, impenetrable statements about waking up to the nature of reality with no instructions as to how to do that, but, but a definite um, enticing sense that, oh, there was more. And these Zen masters with their uh, very eccentric habits and uh, ways seem to be in touch with uh, um, a reality beyond the mundane and um, uh, but it was very very frustrating 
very, very frustrating to read about this and not know what to do about it. And, um, you know, it's pre-internet. I couldn't find a Buddhist center and I didn't know how to find a Zen master. Uh, and uh, I can remember flinging one of these books against the wall of my bedroom once because I was so fed up with reading about enlightenment and having no idea uh, uh, how to approach it. And um, all I was left with was, you know, schoolwork and, and um, exams and, and, and so forth. Um, so for me, this question of consciousness and what is it to be alive and aware and what is really going on uh, has been a preoccupation that's taken me to the Dharma and then has continued in my Dharma life. And I feel so, so fortunate to have come to Tri Ratna <laughs> and had a path that I can follow laid out for me by Bhante, by Sabuti, by many of the, my teachers in, 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 um, in our movement. So, um, one of the things that, uh, in a way, I, well, no, I was going to start talking more theoretically, but I think I want to pause a bit and say, I think we've all had probably, I mean, we wouldn't be here unless we had some experience of some sort of heightened consciousness. I think we've probably all, through meditation or maybe through other experiences, we've all had some sort of glimpse that consciousness has depth to it. It's not, I mean, when I say depth, I'm talking metaphorically, uh, that it's not sort of um, the same all the time. I mean, even if you haven't got peak experiences, it's kind of obvious that, you know, we go to sleep and something happens. We sort of lose awareness in deep sleep, in dream sleep, in dreams, we enter into different, a different kind of consciousness. When I wake up in the morning and I'm dozy, that's a different experience of consciousness and the world looks different to when I'm uh, uh, wide awake. So even at that ordinary level, we know that consciousness has different, as it were, modes. But when we meditate, we can experience that consciousness has not just different modes, but depth to it. Um, and what I mean by depth is that, um, what, do I, what do I mean? I, I think what I mean is that it has a qualitative um, sort of, um, it has deeper values that can come forth through uh, different experiences of consciousness in meditation. So for example, the first time I went on retreat, and, and, and hopefully this, is, this, this rings uh, bells for you. Uh, the first time I went on retreat, I can remember coming out of a meditation and looking at a tree, and it was a winter retreat. So this is, this is um, uh, December in 1994 and looking at a tree, a bare tree against the branches against the sky in Oxfordshire and, and, and regaining this sense of wonder that I was talking about uh, that children have. It was as if I'd never seen a tree before. Uh, I, I felt like, you know, my nephew, as I described him when he was about 18 months old and I'm taking him for a walk and he's looking at a leaf and is completely shocked. I felt like that standing in front of a tree. Uh, it was extremely um, mysterious and exquisitely beautiful in a way that is um, uh, indescribable. My heart opened, but it was also more than my heart. It wasn't a sentimental thing. It was, I was entranced by this thing in front of me uh, that was alive. It was as if um, I could feel um, a kindred 
spirit. I could feel a connection with the life in the tree. Uh, um, that's all that I can describe it. It was like as if we were both alive and the life in the tree wasn't different to um, the life in me. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of um, Dylan Thomas's um, poem, The Force That Through the Green Fuse Drives the Flower Drives My Green Age also, although I've probably misquoted that. that but, but Thomas is talking about much more eloquently about this experience of shared life, of, of, of feeling alive, and it's beautiful. And not just beautiful in the sense of ordinary beauty, but it seems to have a, a luminosity. It, it seems that the world shines. Do you, do you, you can nod if you, if you know what I'm talking about, yeah? So this is, <coughs> this is us entering into a deeper mode of consciousness. And as we experience that deeper mode, the world reflects that back because the world is not separate or the world that we experience isn't separate from the mind that does the experiencing. That, that they're not really separate. Now, if we change our minds, we change our experience of the world. We, we, we also know this from the Metta Bhavna. When we do the Metta Bhavna and we feel connected with Metta and with, um, you know, that it seems to be working, our hearts are open, we come out and people look more like, well, they, 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 they look more beautiful in, in a sense, but you can feel the life in them and you can resonate, you can feel that the life in this stranger is the same as the life in me. Uh, uh, I can remember once um, uh, having this experience in, in London where I was walking around the South Bank and for a couple of hours, the, the whole world lit up. Now it helped that it was sort of a lovely light. Uh, the sun was low um, and, and I was walking near the river and everything seemed lit by the sun. But, but it was more than that. My heart had been opened uh, and, and there was just everything was brimming with radiant light and that light was also love. Meta and light were not two. Interestingly, that experience for me had been sort of um, triggered by looking at some art. So when we, so, so I'd gone to the Tate Britain and with a friend and we'd looked at some, um, a Turner, you know, we'd looked at some Turner paintings uh, and Turner paints light, doesn't he? He paints light and um, I looked at one, at the first painting that I looked at, which I've tried to look at many times since, and it's never had the same effect. <laughs> the first painting I looked at, I was thrust into uh, a sort of dhyanic state. Um, uh, and um, it was more than a dhyanic state. It felt like an assault. It felt like the painting um, grabbed me and grabbed me into it. I was thrust into the world of the painting against, as it were, my will. I didn't ch choose to do that. And um, I knew that Turner was painting from this higher, deeper state of consciousness where the world is experienced as luminous. Everything was of the nature of light. Uh, and there was a physiological response in me. I, I started to feel all this blissful energy. Um, uh, my body was, it was, it was like an ecstatic response, but it also, um, it was weird because I, I felt feverish. So, so I, I thought I was coming down with some sort of uh, infection or, or flu or something. It was, I felt feverish, but it was beautiful. It was ecstatic. And uh, all this through looking at some Turner. Well, actually, there was, there was more than that because I'd been with a friend and we'd spent some time trying to 
really communicate and we'd had a really good communication about the Dharma, but also about his life, my life, um, uh, um, uh, issues that he was facing. Uh, there was a real meeting. And I think that that helped lead to the experience that I had with the, the painting. Communication can transform consciousness. And then it wasn't a coincidence that I'd recently returned from a three week solitary retreat in Tukiloka, where I'd been doing a lot of meditation and um, uh, um, trying to reflect on the nature of mind, <clears throat> on the nature of consciousness. So do you see what I'm trying to say is that consciousness has different depths, has depth to it, and how we, <clears throat> the mind that we enter into uh, affects our experience of the world. The world changes uh, um, in relation to how we are. And this is such a key to that thing because um, uh, most of the time, particularly if we're not mindful, we go about not what well, I do anyway, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I, I believe that external conditions are the main thing that I need to change if I want a happier life. I focus on the externals, you know, uh, and, and if my life isn't going well, it's external conditions that I look to. Maybe it's other people that are, are the difficulty. Maybe it's some illness or sickness or whatever, in, or, or, or things not going my way. What, what I'm trying to point out, what the Dharma is pointing at, is that the key to transforming our world is the mind, is the mind. We can transform our world if we transform our consciousness. And the potential to do that is there all the time, is there all the time. When I was um, younger reading those books on Zen, I used to think that you had to meditate for at least 30 years or something before you got a glimpse of uh, uh, a, a vision, as we call it, perfect vision. But actually it's not true, is it? You know, people who are completely new to Buddhism, people who have never meditated have peak experiences. They have moments of vision where the world shines. And uh, what that's pointing to is that the potential for that, that deeper consciousness to come, come to the fore is there all the time, is there all the time. It's there in every moment of awareness, every moment of life, it's there. What Buddhism is saying is that, look, we can systematically learn to allow that consciousness to, as it were, emerge, or another way to, to get in touch with that depth of consciousness. We can systematically do that. And the Buddhist path seems to be about how do we do that in a systematic way um, and live more and more from this radiant, um, radiant consciousness. So I, what I, I'd like us to do now is, um, uh, I wonder if it's, it's a good time for a tea break. Do you think Vidyasaki have a tea break now? So let's have a, a 10 minute tea break. So, um, well, let's just, um, I've been very imprecise about what I mean by consciousness. I've just tried to evoke some uh, sense of it. And um, actually it's impossible to talk about consciousness because consciousness isn't an object. It's not a thing. You can't make consciousness an object of consciousness. We can be aware, we can be conscious, but in a way consciousness isn't in the world of objects and things. It's what, it's, it's the faculty which apprehends the world. It's it's awareness itself. It doesn't exist as a thing that you can become aware of. And as soon as we talk about it as a thing, 
you know, as soon as I give it a, 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 a noun, a, um, a, a name, like consciousness, we've falsified it because we immediately think we're talking about a, th a thing like we talked about tables and trees. And consciousness is not like that. So it, it's a category error to think of it as a thing. So, and yet, um, we do need some way of talking about it. So all throughout these four days, I'm going to be talking about it. And really, we need to be remembering that in talking about it, it's we're talking metaphorically. Uh, it's a sort of as if kind of way of talking. Um, there's something going on, but consciousness isn't a thing. It's, it's what allows us to know it's knowing itself, you could say. In the Pali Canon, in one place in the Pali Canon, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says, he says, luminous is this mind, but it is defiled by adventitious defilements. So luminous is this mind. So he talks about, so there... He's using the word mind. I'm going to use the word consciousness more than mind, but sometimes interchangeably. Luminous is this mind. Now, when he says luminous, that too, he's talking metaphorically, but he's using the language of light. He's saying it's radiant, it's bright, it's clear, it's luminous. He says luminous is this mind, but it is defiled by adventitious defilements. What he means by adventitious is that they're extraneous, they're not intrinsic, they're added on. They're coverings, they're like clouds that cover the sky. So sometimes Buddhism uses this, this image of the sky to talk about consciousness. It says the sky is clear, pristine, radiant, boundless, but it's covered over often, at least in our experience, by clouds. So the defilements are compared to clouds. The defilements is a translation of kleshas. Klesha <laughs> means poison or defilement. So what's being got at is the poisons, well, they're, they're variants on greed and hatred and delusion of craving and aversion and delusion. There's other poisons like pride and conceit and so forth. But the, they're, they're variants, you could say, on the delusion that we are a fixed and separate entity. And I'll say more about this later on. And, and, and then as soon as we have that delusion, there's a craving to sustain that fixed separate entity and uh, an aversion towards whatever threatens it. So these defilements, which are very, very um, instinctive, are nevertheless adventitious, they're extraneous, and they, they cover this luminous sky-like consciousness which is radiant all the time. It's a bit like <laughs> when you fly, <laughs> um, when you're in an aeroplane and you, and it's a cloudy day and, 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 and then suddenly the aeroplane breaks through the clouds and you're in this clear blue sky and the clouds are below you. You've broken through. It's like the skylight mind is like that all the time. The radiance is there all the time. If it wasn't, and we'd experience it, but for <coughs> the clouds, the defilements. The Buddha goes on to say, he says, the uninstructed worldling does not understand this as it really is. Therefore, I say that for such people, there is no development of mind. 
So the uninstructed worldling, I'm afraid, is us in the sense that um, the unenlightened person. But at least with us, maybe it's not us because we have had some instruction and maybe we have had some experience of the truth of this teaching. But he's saying ordinary folk, the uninstructed worldling does not understand this as it really is. Therefore, I say that for such people, there is no development of mind. Then he repeats it. He says, luminous is the mind, but it is defiled by adventitious defilements. The well-instructed noble disciple understands this as it really is. Therefore, for him, there is development of mind. You could say, therefore, for her, there is development of mind. So for us, we're trying to become, at least if we're not already, well-instructed, noble disciples who understand this as it really is. And therefore, for us, there is development of mind. So, so the assumption there is that if you don't even understand the potential of mind to shine forth, if you don't understand that there is this radiance, then you probably won't develop because you probably won't um, make an effort to develop. Um, you know, by chance, the radiance might break through, but for most people, if they're not trying to systematically develop, those peak experiences come, but they also go, and then they're forgotten. So what we're trying to do is systematically uncover the radiance behind the defilements. So before we say any more, I'd like us to go into groups. And in the groups, what I'd like you to, in small groups, what I'd like us to talk about is, um, well, if I, I, I'm inviting you to talk about your experiences of the radiance. Or, or of peak experience, however um, uh, sort of low or high that experience is, any experience that you've had that is significant, that points to this, this deeper truth about consciousness, this deeper truth about um, uh, the nature of uh, the mind. Um, so I've tried to talk a little bit or hint at some of my peak experiences. And I'd like you to think about, well, what are your peak experiences? Peak experiences might not be a great word for you, but, but uh, nevertheless, these heightened states that sometimes break through that we can experience either through formal practice or sometimes they seem to come from nowhere. But also I'd like you to talk about or think about what do you think were the conditions that led to that experience that you want to talk about? And probably you've only got uh, time to talk about one. So, you know, you, you may have lots, but pick one. And what are the conditions you think that contributed to that deeper uh, experience of, uh, well, let's call it radiance. And, and, and thirdly, so in, in, in talking about the peak experience, I'd also like you to see if you can describe how it felt, what were the qualities of it? Yeah, so, so a peak experience, its qualities and the conditions that you think might have contributed to, to, to it. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's good. Um, thank you, Kamala Naga for... Um, doing the work there. So um, it'd be good to hear from a couple of people, uh, 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 two or three of you, if, if you're willing to share something of what you were talking about in